All right, I'd like you to turn, please, to the book of Acts, chapter 15. Acts, chapter 15. I'm going to read the first 12 verses. The Lord willing, we will need to get further than that, but at least just for the purpose of reading, uh, Acts 15, verse 1 says this, uh, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. When, therefore, Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenice and Samaria and declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying, that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider this matter. Then, uh, and sorry, and when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us, that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. And all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us this morning. Now, this chapter is all about the defense of the gospel. And in many ways, it's kind of an unhappy chapter because it begins and ends with a dispute. And nobody likes disputes. And this chapter starts with one and ends with one. But the first one for sure was a necessary dispute. The very gospel itself is, is really on, on the table here and, and it has to be defended. And so there's this necessary dispute. Now, you might think, what has this got to do with Father's Day? Let me just say this. If you have a father who has experienced the soul-saving gospel, you are a very blessed person. It's a wonderful thing to have a saved dad. Uh, and if you are a dad, it's a wonderful thing for your children that you're a saved dad. Imagine what kind of upbringing you would have had if your father was not saved. You probably wouldn't be here this morning. So that's the connection with Father's Day. I've, I've done my bit <laughs> for Father's Day. And now we're going to get down to the serious business. So here we are, this, this chapter, the defense of the gospel, along with the epistle to the Galatians. This section emphasizes the importance of defending the gospel against the attacks of the enemy of our souls. Robert G. Lee was declared by President Franklin Roosevelt in this way. He said, we recognize General Robert E. Lee as one of our greatest American Christians and one of our greatest American gentlemen. Now, that was before the days of cancel culture mm -hmm. because... He would have been canceled because he was on the wrong side, you right? He was on the Confederate side, even though he personally had no slaves, didn't believe in slavery, fought for the Confederates because he believed in states' rights, not because of slavery. Kind of interesting thing. But anyway, I'm not going to get sidetracked. My wife warned me this morning, don't get sidetracked. So I'm listening, listening. But, but this is how Lee described himself. 
So here's one person saying he's our greatest American Christian, one of the greatest American gentlemen. This is what Lee said. I am nothing but a poor sinner trusting in Christ alone for salvation. Amen. What a wonderful way to describe yourself. Nothing but a poor sinner trusting in Christ alone for salvation. And Lee's understanding of the gospel was that of the original reformers, men like Luther and others, who believed this, simply this, that the gospel was this, faith alone in Christ alone plus nothing. Amen. Right? Faith alone in Christ alone plus. The, and the simple gospel has always been under attack. On the one hand, there are those that want to add to the gospel, to pervert it by, by adding something else, as we're going to see in this chapter. Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you can't be saved. And so they're saying, it's not just Christ's work, but you've got to be circumcised as well. And so a false gospel is always Christ plus something else. So they add to the gospel. And so that's the one way the gospel is under attack. Another way the gospel is under attack is when it's not preached. A hidden gospel is no good to anybody. That's why we got to get excised about the gospel, because if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. And so that's a problem, too. If the gospel isn't preached or proclaimed, we have a difficulty here. Uh, it's, it's, again, the enemy has subtly made the gospel of no effect because it's not preached. And so on the one hand, adding to it, the other one, ignoring it. We can't do either one. And so we need to be those that are faithful in proclaiming the gospel. Now, notice verse one, certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Notice this, the, the simple phrase here, except ye be. And the emphasis on ye, what you have to do, unless you, I think the New King James says, unless you. And the thought is this, um, that they, they're saying that you have to do something. The emphasis on what you've got to do. And the emphasis of the gospel we preach is not about what we have to do. It's about what Jesus did. Right? It's about what Christ did on Calvary. That's the emphasis of true gospel preaching. It's about the work he did, not what we do. But the false gospel is on what you've got to do. And so I want you to notice two things that stand out here in this verse one is the length that false teachers will go they will literally cross land and sea to make one convert to their perverted gospel these men came down from judea well i don't know if you've ever measured antioch to judea but it's 300 miles at 20 miles a day, that's 15 days. On foot, they made a 15-day journey from Ju Judea, Jerusalem. We're going to find out it was Jerusalem that they came from, all the way to Antioch to add this burden to these new converts. You've got to be circumcised. And, and what it tells me is this, that false teachers go to tremendous lengths. And who is it that comes knocking on your door? Who is it that's really out there with their men? It's often the false teacher, isn't it? Whereas sometimes we want hardly thrust the street to tell somebody the true message. Shame on us in one sense, right? But, but they'll go to tremendous lengths. And we see that right here. 300 miles, 20 miles a day, 15 days, just to, by the way, they can't stand to see joyful christians rejoicing in christ <laughs> they can't stand that they, they want to put this burden on top of them and then we said the emphasis of their message is always placed on you unless you what you must do in order to be saved and so they want to put burden on what you've got to do rather than the emphasis on what the lord jesus has already done so it goes something like this unless you're baptized unless you take the sacraments, unless you're circumcised. Uh, and the list could go on. It's, it's, you've got to have, Christ is okay to a point, but you have to do this. It's always something else. And, and so they want to add to the simple gospel. And we said the emphasis on the New Testament gospel is simply on believing 
in the finished work that someone else, the Lord Jesus, did on Calvary to pay the penalty of our sin. And so they, they want to add to it. So as a result of this, we notice in verse 2, when therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them. And again, I want you to notice the double emphasis here, dissension and disputation. In other words, they can't let this go. There's, there's times, brethren, when we've got to stand up and we've got to speak up and we can't let it go. The gospel cannot be compromised. We have to stand up and say, no, we can't accept this. So Paul and Barnabas, nice guys as they are, they just can't handle this. They stand up and they dispute about it. There are areas as believers where we can agree to disagree. Okay? Not everybody has the same view of the sons of God in Genesis 6, and it's not going to keep you out of heaven if you have the wrong view, okay? Uh, if you think it's uh, the sons of Cain or the daughters of that kind of thing, it, it, you're not going to be lost. Uh, you might not have, you miss out on a lot of blessing in understanding scripture, but you're not going to be lost. So we can agree to disagree on certain things, but when it comes to the gospel, it's not one of those areas. In fact, Turn with me to Galatians, and you might want to put a marker or a ribbon in Galatians, because we're going to be kind of cross-referencing Galatians 1 and 2 quite a bit. But in Galatians 1, in verses 6 through 9, Paul puts it this way. He says, I marvel that you are soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ but though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be a cursed. As we said before, so I say now again, in other words, if you're not hearing this right, I'm going to repeat it because you might be a bit shocked that I would say such a thing. But just so you understand what I'm saying here, he says, uh, as we said before, so we say now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. That's pretty strong language, isn't it? A, a, a curse upon him who has the audacity to preach any other gospel. And so we can see this is a very serious thing. Uh, very strong words. And so this is such a fundamental issue, getting the gospel right, uh, that Paul and Barnabas uh, have to do something. They can't just let this rest. And so again, back in chapter 15, verse 2, when therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. So they're going to go up to Jerusalem to discuss this question. Now, it says Paul and Barnabas and certain other. And this is, again, where Galatians comes in handy. And Galatians chapter 2, you'll notice that at least uh, one of those certain other was a fellow called Titus. And so if you look there, Galatians 2, I'll just read the first five verses because it really kind of fits beautifully with Acts 15. It says, then 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem. By the way, that would make this AD 49 when this council takes place in Jerusalem, AD 49. 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. So here's the Titus. Now, remember, Titus was a Gentile and he wasn't circumcised. And when he takes him up there, they're desperate to circumcise him and they won't let him do it. So Titus, and Titus, who the book of Titus, the same guy. And so it says, and I went up by revelation. Now, that's kind of interesting, too, isn't it? Because when we read in, in chapter 15, there's no aspect of we went up by revelation. In chapter 15, it talks about this agreement with the church. We're going to go up and sort this issue out. But Paul gives us the divine side. The human side is the church said we're going to go up and sort this out. The divine side is that he had a revelation from God. You better go and sort this thing out. So he went up by revelation. And so he says, and, com and communicated unto them the gospel, which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, 
was compelled to be circumcised, and that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. So let me just say this. When they go up to Jerusalem, they went up on the one hand because of this prompting by God, uh, this divine revelation, also because of the agreement of the church. But they didn't go up because they were summoned by an ecclesiastical court. A lot of people have used this chapter to kind of justify the whole kind of papal gatherings and all this kind of stuff like Jerusalem is kind of the Rome of the of the early church and all this they didn't go up because they were summoned by some kind of ecclesiastical court or denominational hierarchy they went to Jerusalem not because it was the Vatican of the early church but because it is where the problem had come from they went to Jerusalem because this is where these false teachers had come from. And they went to the source to deal with it. And by the way, when you're dealing with problems, it's always the best thing to go to the source. <laughs> right? Go right to the source. Don't go roundabout. Go right to the source. So they go to the source. And the source was J Jerusalem. So they go there to, to get this matter. Of course, they also knew that's where the apostles were located at that time. And so they go up there, verse three, it says, and being brought on their way by the church. I love that. So the idea is this, that as they make their way up, uh, at least part of the way, the whole church comes with them to send them off with their blessing. They realize how important this mission is. The very gospel depends on it. And so you can just imagine them walking out of the city and the whole church is walking along with them just kind of sending them along and bidding them Godspeed in their mission. And so as they go, they're brought on their way by the church. They pass through Phoenice and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they cause great joy unto all their brethren. There already were testimonies established in, in uh, these uh, areas, uh, in, in Phoenice and Samaria, as we know, Philip the evangelist had gone down to Samaria. We knew there were churches there. And so they, they give a report, they give missionary reports along their way of what God had done among the Gentiles. And as they, uh, as it were, rehearsed what God had done, uh, we noticed that it brought great joy unto all the brethren. And I ask the question, what brings you joy? Mm. What brought them joy was hearing that precious souls among the Gentiles had been gloriously saved. That's where they got their joy. It, it wasn't on some football game or basketball, whatever kind of game, and a result, because that would be a temporary joy anyway, because they're going to lose again eventually. <laughs> but their joy was, was matching the joy of heaven. What happens in heaven when one sinner repents? It says there's joy in the presence of the angels. And so when they heard it, their joy lined up with heaven. They were just rejoicing that God, and, and, and every time you hear of some sinner saved, why we should rejoice. Eternally saved soul. What a wonderful thing. And, and so that's what they did. They were very joyful about this, to hear what God had done. And it says, and when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. So I want you to notice that in Jerusalem assembly, they were received by the apostles and elders. I just want you to notice that there's no other hierarchy here. There's not, you know, bishops and prelates and cardinals and all of this stuff. There's, it's just really simple, isn't it? There's the apostles, which are temporary. They're foundational. They're going to pass off the scene. And then their elders. That's it, right? Just a simple higher up New Testament uh, way of things. And we, we just see this in the word of God. And so they also gave a report to them and um, brought this uh, report of what things God had done with them. And they're very quick to point out, by the way, uh, that whenever they give a report, it's always what God had done through them. 
It's not what they had done, but what God, because it's God that saves souls. It's God that works. It's God, the Holy Spirit that moves and works. And, and so they're very quick to give the glory where it belongs. This is what, look what God has done. Isn't it good to look at what God has done? And so we thank God for his working and they, they share that. But, but notice verse five, but <laughs> here's a reaction. Here's a contrast word. He says, but there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and command them to keep the law of Moses. So here's a damper on the thing, right? Well, it's okay as far as it's gone. It's good that the Gentiles are showing an interest. But, you know, really, if we want to get them right, they've got to become circumcised and they've got to keep the law of Moses. That's the Pharisaical party. By the way, Paul used to be one of them. <laughs> so, so he understands how they think, but they, they can't get past this idea of the law. They are just enamored by the law. And so they, they want uh, them to be put under it. Now, again, I, I just wonder, later on, we're going to see that, that Peter's going to say, this is a yoke of bondage that we could not bear. I wonder whether Pharisees kind of looking at the law kind of almost through rosy colored spectacles <laughs> like nobody can keep it only one person who ever walked this earth kept the law of god that was the lord jesus and yet they they just want to put this on everybody and so uh again if it was just a, a matter of of you know what well, you might be more spiritual if you do these things maybe they could have let it go but this is not, as we read in verse 1, this is about salvation. Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. And, and so we can't let this, do, this go. Now, why this is so important, and, and again, it's important enough that in verse 6, it says the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. It was, it was considered important enough for them to discuss this whole matter together. And, and why is it so important? Because... This, the answer to this question is going to determine whether Christianity is going to be just a, another subsect of Judaism. You know, you've got Hasidic Jews and you've got Orthodox Jews, and now you're going to have Messianic Jews. If the Pharisees got their way, it would just be another subsect of Judaism. But the church is altogether different. Amen. It's a new creation. It, God is doing something new, Jew and Gentile in one body, right? And so this is this is determining the very future of Christianity, what the gospel is, what we believe, what is essential to salvation is has got huge implications. And so the apostles and elders come together to consider the critical matter. By the way, it's good, isn't it, that they were actually able to discuss doctrine in a civil way. <laughs> it's amazing. Sometimes you say, oh, you, you better not talk about doctrine. It causes too much division. Well, they obviously were able to do it, and they were able to do it in such a way that they were able to come to some conclusions. In fact, if I could just give you a kind of my outline, which I should have done at the beginning, but I get so excited I forget these things. In verses 1 through 6 is the disagreement, and then verse 7 through 18 is the discussion. And then verse 19 to 35 is the decision. So there's, there's, there's this uh, disagreement, there's discussion, which we're about to enter in. And then finally, there's a decision. They're actually able to come up with a clear, definite decision. So in verse 7, it says, when there had been much disputing, so obviously there's a lot of coming back and forth here. It says, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago, God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe, and God which knoweth the hearts bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. So Peter rises up to speak. And by the way, this is the last time you're going to hear a word from Peter in the book of Acts. He's just going to fade right off the scene. Now, we'll hear more from him in 1 Peter and 2 Peter. But as far as the book of Acts is concerned, 
This is his final message. From now on, Paul is going to be sent to stage, right? And Peter's just going to fade off the scene. And so what is Peter's last word in the book of Acts to us? Well, he's a reminding them of what happened in the conversion of Cornelius. And I think we said when we did Acts chapter 10 and 11, that those chapters are so important that there's more space in Acts devoted to the conversion of Cornelius than to any other issue other than the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus is number one in terms of space devoted to, to it. Conversion of Cornelius is number two. This is obviously very significant. And so Peter says, um, <laughs> reminding them what had happened, that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Now, did that require circumcision? Was there any talk of circumcision in Acts chapter 10 or 11? None whatsoever. In fact, uh, they, never, never mind circumcision. There was no, they didn't even have to raise their hand or walk the aisle or pray a prayer. While Peter was speaking, it says that the Holy Ghost fell upon them as he did on us at the beginning. In other words, all they simply did is as the word of God was being preached, they actually just believed it. And the Spirit of God, and this is why he says uh, in verse 8, God which knows the hearts. He knew that these were really saved by believing the message that they were being preached to them. God, knowing their hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost. In other words, they were saved simply by believing the message they heard. Right? No, no walking the aisle, no praying a prayer, no, no weeping, no, you know, sometimes people, you know what happens is people want to clean the fish before they've caught it. That's what they want to do. They, they, you know, the problem with the false gospel is it mixes up sanctification with justification. That's what a false gospel is. It, it's trying to clean up the fish before you even caught it. Once a man is caught by Jesus Christ, Lord will clean him up. <laughs> and he'll change him. He'll put a new heart within him. He'll change him from the inside out. He'll become a new creature. But how does that happen? He believes the message. And then that brings about the change. And by the way, <laughs> even this idea of making Jesus Lord. Well, how can you tell a non-saved person to make Jesus Lord? He has to believe in Jesus first. And afterwards, he can make Jesus Lord of his life. But the gospel is, well, the Philippian jailer. We're going to see that in the next chapter. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And thou shalt be saved. That's what the gospel is. It's faith alone in Christ alone. And so here's Cornelius household. Exhibit A, God saving Gentiles. How did he do it? Well, it says the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. They just believed the message. No altar call. How did they get saved without an altar call? I don't know how that works. How did that happen? <laughs> but they did. Praise God that they did. And, and so Peter says in verse 9, he put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith isn't that a beautiful i mean just think about sometimes we just read these things and we don't let it sink in when you believe the gospel what was your heart like before that well according to scripture it was deceitful and desperately wicked above all things who could know it you had a dirty wicked heart and the day that you trusted jesus christ as your personal savior he purified your heart by faith that's marvelous, isn't it? This is this is the this gospel is so utterly marvelous. And maybe you're too used to it. I don't know, but it, this should thrill our souls to hear this. This is what this gospel does. And so he says, Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? You see, what he's saying is this, that, that the law really was a yoke of bondage. 
we we couldn't do it. We couldn't live up to it. We couldn't keep it. We couldn't do it. And it's true. Just again, let's go back to Galatians, but this time to chapter five, please. Galatians five. What you just see this this idea of a yoke of bondage. Galatians five. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. And so the idea is this, that, that the law is, is burdensome. Uh, if you if you become circumcised, if you say I'm gonna I'm gonna follow the law, you're committed to do it all to keep the whole, it's it's a collective whole. You've got to do it's all or nothing. You can't just pick and choose with the law. You do the whole thing or nothing. And if you do the whole thing, you got to do the whole thing all the time, the whole time, twenty four seven, seven days a week for the rest of your life. If that's what you want to be measured under, see how that works. And and so it's a yoke of bondage. What is the purpose of the law then? Oh, again, Galatians 3.19 says it was added because of the transgression. It's not that sin wasn't in the world before the law, but, but we knew after the law that we were actual lawbreakers, right? It showed us that we'd, we'd broken it, you know? Uh, you know? We know it's irresponsible to drive in a school zone at 120 miles an hour. We know that, right? Anybody with any ounce of sense would know that. But when you have a speed limit sign saying 30 miles an hour or 20 miles an hour and you're doing you're you're caught. I mean, you're you're doing 120. You're you're clearly breaking a law. <laughs> yeah. And not just common sense. You're breaking a clearly stated law. And so the law was, was there for the transgression. It was also the law was also given as a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ as a tutor. It was it was given to show us we needed a savior. To show us we were lawbreakers, that that we had done wrong. And you know, you can look back and have fond memories of some of your schoolmasters. But aren't you glad? Aren't you glad you're not in school anymore? Are you glad that you're not? I'm really glad I'm not in school anymore. Yeah. Now I'm, I'm still in the school of God, but I'm not in that school. I'm really glad I'm done. And I have some some of my teachers, I have fond memories of them. And you could have fond memories of the law, it had a purpose. It was to show us we needed a savior. But in coming to Christ, we don't need that tutor anymore. And that's this whole point here. It's a yoke of bondage. And it's interesting. I, I can't help but think of this. But when I read these verses, uh, my immediate thought, why tempt you God put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? I couldn't help but think of Matthew's gospel, chapter 11, and the lovely words of the Lord Jesus. I'm going to read them to you because I want to make sure I get it correctly. Matthew 11, 28. Come on me, all that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light what a difference come to christ don't come to moses don't come to sinai don't come to the law that's a yoke of bondage but christ oh he altogether different and so he says in verse 11 but we believe now notice peter's speaking now the we of every, all of them. This is the apostolic we. We believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved, that's the Jews, even as they, the Gentiles. And isn't it nice? He says, <clears throat> through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Don't you just love that word grace? Undeserved, unmerited favor. That's how any of us got saved. Did any of us deserve it? No, we deserved hell, right? That's what we deserved. But out of unmerited, undeserved faith, we've been saved. By grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. 
And so this is the gospel that we love and appreciate. And so Peter defends it. And then in verse 12, it says, Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. And so not only do we have Peter's testimony of what God had done in Cornelius' household, now that's joined by Barnabas and Paul recounting what miracles and wonders God had done among the Gentiles by them. And, and again, giving evidence that God is working here, uh, the Lord working with them. That's what they're emphasizing. God, I mean, God is clearly in this. Uh, even though we have not pushed any of these Gentiles for circumcision, it's evident that God was accepting these Gentiles apart from circumcision and simply by faith. And so they talk about all the things God had brought among the Gentiles by them. And now we come to verse 13, because, you see, human experience is not ultimately enough. Does it line up with Scripture? Right? Because if we want to go just by experience, a lot of people out there say, well, I speak in a, a strange tongue. Now, if experience alone is what determines it, well, maybe they're right. Okay? Those are got to have something more than just experience. Does the experience line up with the word of God? Right? Because, yeah, it's wonderful to have experience, but we've got to have scripture as well. And so after that, verse 13, after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, men and brethren, hearken unto me. Now, remember James, he's the Lord's uh, half-brother. Uh, he's the guy who wrote the epistle of James, Galatians 2, verse 9. He was a pillar in the church at Jerusalem. Uh, in, in fact, Cephas, James, and John were kind of the, 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 the leading lights in the assembly in terms of responsibility before God. And so he says, after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon, that's Peter, hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles. So this, in other words, Paul and Barnabas are not the first to do this. God already did it through, through Peter. I want them to know that at the first. It's very significant. They visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Isn't it? That's, again, this is what we're all about here is this, that we believe that God, even now, at this very hour, is calling out from among the Gentiles a people for his name. And that's why we gather in the name of the Lord Jesus, isn't it? Because God is doing that. That's what he's, it's all about gathered to his name. He's calling out a people to his name. And, and James agrees with that. God, the first did visit the Gentiles, take out with them a people for his name. That's Cornelius and his household. And to this, and here's the important thing, agree the words of the prophets as it is written. After this, I will return and build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up that the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. So, what he says is simply this that what is happening among the Gentiles, fits perfectly with what the prophets said. In other words, it's in harmony with the word of God. Now, he talks about prophets in a plural sense, but his quotation is from a specific prophet, and that's Amos. And that's why the minor prophets are important, because uh, obviously this is it brought to the table is very significant right, in this whole passage. And so let's just look at Amos chapter 9. Amos chapter 9, just after the book of Joel. So Hosea, Joel, Amos. I don't know about you, but if I have any difficulty finding my way around the Bible, it's the mind prophets. I have to confess that I, <clears throat> they're the hardest part of me to find my way around them. Well, let's just, um, we're going to break in. Um, Verse 9, I want you just to see some of the things that Amos is saying here. He says, The Lord will command, and I will sit the house of Israel, all nations, like a corn is sifted in the sea, yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. 
all the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, which say that evil shall not overtake nor prevent us. So first of all, he begins by talking about a time of sifting for the children of Israel. This is Amos chapter 9. Amos chapter 9, verse 9 and 10. Amos 9, 9 and 10. Sifting. Isn't it interesting that, that, the, that Amos talks about the time when Israel are going to be sifted? You remember that elsewhere it talks about a day of Jacob's trouble? There's, there's a time coming when God is going to do a big sifting of the nation of Israel. Talking about the tribulation period, isn't it? it and so he says in verse 11, In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen and close up the breaches thereof, and I'll raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old. So after this time of sifting for the nation of Israel, God is going to rebuild the tabernacle of David and set it up. In other words, he's going to restore Israel. He's going to restore the tabernacle of David was what before the temple was built. Remember, he, he moved the tabernacle into Jerusalem and carried the ark and brought it there. So in other words, uh, the whole sacrificial system is going to be reestablished again and all the rest of it. Raise up the ruins. I'll build it in the, as in the days of old that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all of the heathen, which are called by my name, saith the Lord that doeth this. And so after Israel are restored, he talks about the fact there's going to be a great work done amongst the Gentiles. Remember, if, 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 if they're setting aside, Romans, Romans 11 has brought blessing to the Gentiles. What will their restoration be? Do you remember that? Romans 11. But life from the dead, right? There's going to be a great ingathering of Gentiles when Israel are restored. And so all he's simply saying is this. It's evident from Scripture that Gentiles are going to be blessed without any reference to circumcision. And so that's all he's simply saying. That clearly uh, God is going to accept Gentiles. We know it because the prophets say it apart from circumcision. Well, let's go back now to Acts, and we'll, we'll close with this, because this is really exciting. So he says in verse 16, after this, I will return and build again the tabernacle of David. This is Acts 15, 16, which is fallen down. We'll build the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. Now, we might ask the question now, well, what is the after this in the context here? Well, he's just talked about God at the first to visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. That's what God is doing right now, isn't it? And once that last Gentile is brought in to the body of Christ and is saved, after this, he will return and he will rebuild the tabernacle of David. Isn't that exciting? After God has finished what he's doing with the Gentiles, he's going to take up his dealings again with Israel again going to restore them and then even once he restores them there'll be an even greater number of gentiles that will come so he's bringing gentiles now he's going to restore israel and then he's going to bring even more gentiles and so all he's saying is look the scriptures agree with this we shouldn't be shocked about this this is what the word of god is saying and so then he comes and kind of concludes it all and he says this wherefore verse 19 my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. Don't trouble them. Don't put the yoke of bondage upon them. And brethren, we need to make sure we don't put a yoke of bondage on God's people. The yoke of bondage is when we try to bring them under something other than what Scripture says. Right? We don't want to do that. We don't want to cross land and sea to make one convert to our bondage system stand fast in the liberty where christ hath made you free you know how wonderful it is to be free in christ isn't it and so the gospel our time is gone we haven't finished the chapter we'll come back and visit it again but i want to just say for now this simple thing and that is this don't add to the gospel of the grace of God. And don't rob people of the gospel of the grace of God by hiding it. <laughs> Preach it. Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine, right? Let's preach the glorious gospel that men 
are gloriously saved by faith alone, in Christ alone, plus nothing. Praise God for that simple, simple gospel. Don't ever lose the simplicity that there is in Christ. Let's pray. Our Father, we're so grateful for the word of God, and we're so grateful for the day that we heard the glad tidings. And we're glad that it wasn't told us unless you do this, this, and this, because immediately we would have faltered. But oh, Father, how thankful it was told us about what someone else did in our place, in our stead. Somebody who lived a perfect life, a life we could never live. Someone who died as our substitute and sin bearer on that cruel cross of Calvary. And that whoever simply believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. Oh, Father, what a gospel. Help us to love it. Help us to preach it so that Christ is exalted. Sinners are humbled just by the, uh, the simplicity of the message and gloriously trans transformed through the preaching of the cross. We'll give thee the glory in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.